In this video, we're going to introduce chapter 23. We're going to talk about modern evolutionary theory. Uh, we're going to talk about the evolutionary forces that can drive evolution in a population. And we're going to um, just introduce the concept of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So in Darwin's conception of evolution, he just sort of had this sense that organisms tended to pass on the traits that they possessed to their offspring. But he really had no idea how that happened. So in the 20th century, we simply combined evolutionary theory with a better understanding of genetics to redefine evolution as a shift in the gene pool of a population um, over the generations. So we just want to talk about kind of how that works. Um, so to give you a simple um, example of how evolution of a gene pool might work, let's assume that we've got a small population of organisms. We're just going to examine one gene. We're going to assume that it's a simple Mendelian gene in inheritance. So uh, two alleles, uh, one dominant over the other. Let's say that black fur is dominant over recessive sandy. And let's just go ahead and assume that we already know the genotypes of all the organisms, which is a big assumption. But we'll talk about how uh, we can use uh, uh, phenotypes to determine genotypes later. So uh, if we could actually count all of the alleles in this population, we could do that pretty easily. So um, I've just highlighted all the ones that are dominant uh, here. So we could say that maybe 17 or so percent of the alleles are dominant. And that means that 82 percent or so of the alleles are recessive. So let's just say that maybe we could come back to this population maybe five generations later, and maybe they looked like this instead. Uh, so we could once again count the dominant alleles. And maybe if I count now, I find that about 34% of the alleles are dominant, and 65% of the alleles are recessive. We would say that that's quite a shift from five generations ago. So we would simply call that shift evolution. This population seems to be shifting more towards the black color fur allele um, in the overall population. Uh, so that is now what we're calling evolution. Um, I give this particular example for a reason. I want students to appreciate that just because an allele is genetically recessive, that says nothing about whether it's uh, uh, how widespread in the population it might be. So for example here, maybe sandy color fur is just more advantageous than black color fur. So sometimes students ask me the question, OK, so if 82% of the alleles are recessive, does it become dominant? And uh, no, it does not become genetically dominant. So just to try and be clear about that, remember that genetic dominance is simply a case of if you're heterozygous, if you have both the dominant and the recessive allele, to be genetically dominant simply means that you show the dominant phenotype and you hide the recessive phenotype. So genetic dominance or recessiveness, as it were, has nothing to do with how prevalent or how widespread the allele is in the overall population. If most organisms are homozygous recessive, then that just means that the recessive allele is very widespread. But um, that says nothing about that it's genetically recessive. Uh, for example, in the human population, we estimate that maybe 99% of people are homozygous recessive for polydactyly. Most of us are just born with five fingers instead of, say, six or multiple digits, um, even though having multiple digits is actually genetically dominant. So again, uh, dominance and recessiveness has nothing to do with how widespread an allele is. So um, with all of that, let's talk about what would cause the allele frequencies of a gene pool to shift in a population over generations. So natural selection is still part of that story. Um, we're not throwing away Darwin's idea of natural selection. But once we sort of redefined evolution in that more specific way, uh, we proposed additional forces that could cause that very um, gene pool shift. So natural selection is still one of five forces. Um, to be fair to Darwin, he also proposed the force of sexual selection, also called non-random mating, um, as a driver of evolution. Um, but unknown to Darwin were the other three listed here, gene flow, genetic drift, and mutation. Um, he didn't know how new traits were created, but we now know that it's basically created through the process of mutation. So all five of these are kind of considered the modern evolutionary forces. 
I'm not actually going to comment very much on them here in this video because I'm going to want my students to kind of research these in class. But make sure you can tell me these five forces. And what I want to do in this video is I'd like to contrast the idea of a population evolving with sort of the opposite concept. Uh, what happens if there is no evolutionary force present? What happens to the gene pool of a population that's not evolving? Um, well, theoretically, the gene pool's allele frequency should stay exactly the same from generation to generation. And we call that kind of concept Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, um, named after the two scientists who both proposed it. So um, we just want you guys to kind of appreciate that, that um, a population being in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is a bit of an ideal concept. So there's really no population that's truly ever in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But it's still a useful concept for teaching biology because oftentimes populations can sort of um, be assumed to be in equilibrium. They behave as if they are in equilibrium. So let's kind of talk about that. Let's just think about each evolutionary force and sort of its opposite, um, what would be required to keep the population in equilibrium. So um, natural selection would be a force that would shift the population towards the allele that, that favors survival and reproduction. Um, and we would assume that a population would then be in equilibrium if there if, if all phenotypes had an equal survival or reproductive advantage. Um, sexual selection involves mate preference, so you guys are going to research that. And we, we would assume that a population would be in equilibrium if all the individuals are mating somewhat randomly. They're not um, um, picking mates to mate with. Gene flow is another evolutionary force involving uh, when, when organisms of the same species come in or leave the population and take their genes or alleles with them. So we have to assume that there's no emigration, no leaving, or no immigration, no um, um, individuals entering the population um, over the generations to be in equilibrium. Genetic drift is a really interesting evolutionary force. It's essentially a very broad force talking about random evolution. So um, to avoid the randomness of sexual reproduction, um, the, the, the Hardy-Weinberg population would theoretically need to be infinitely large for the sample size to be large enough to where we always get what we predict in, in the, the randomness of sexual reproduction. So that's the one where students typically say, well, come on, there, yeah, that's impossible. A population cannot be infinitely large. So all we want you to appreciate is the larger the population size, the less randomness we would expect to see through genetic drift. And then finally, um, there would need to be no mutation or, uh, uh, you know, in real populations, a very slow rate of mutation creating new alleles to keep the population in equilibrium. So again, if you're kind of wondering why should I care about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, um, especially if it, it can never truly occur, um, the comparison that I would make would be it's sort of like the ideal gas law in chemistry class. Uh, no real gas behaves exactly like the ideal gas, um, but, but in certain conditions, gases can be close enough to the ideal gas that we can still use um, its understanding and, and the theory of it to learn about how gases behave. So I want to say the same thing is true about many natural populations. We can use Hardy-Weinberg mathematics if they behave close enough to make the assumption that the population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So we can do some interesting mathematics. And I'm just going to sort of introduce the mathematics in this video. I intend to make a future video where I'm just going to kind of walk you through some of the practice problems. Um, but Hardy-Weinberg mathematics involves two equations, um, p plus q equals 1 and p squared plus 2pq plus q equals 1. And so what do those equations really represent? Um, the p plus q uh, equals 1 equation really represents the allele frequencies themselves. Um, so this has nothing to do with organisms. This has to do with the allele percentages. Um, we're using the letter p to represent the uh, 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 percentage of alleles that are dominant although we don't typically write it as a percent, we always write these as decimals, okay? Um, so in that other example, I think I had somewhere around maybe 15% 
of the alleles in that gene pool were dominant, so we would write that as 0 0.15 in this kind of mathematics. Um, Q then simply represents the opposite idea, the percent of alleles that are recessive, once again written as a decimal. So if 85% or so in that example were recessive in that gene pool, then we'd just write that as 0 0.85. And all we're saying when we say it has to equal 1 is that sort of represents 100% essentially. Um, so because there are only two alleles in these simplified models, we're saying that um, the, 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 the frequencies of the two alleles have to add up to 100%. Okay? Once again, that equation does not refer to individuals, and I'll try and show you an example of that in just a minute. Um, P squared, um, let, let's think about this equation. This set of equations really does refer to organisms. So when you're thinking about organisms, you want to think about this equation first. Um, P squared really represents P times P, right, or two P's. Um, and if P represents the dominant allele in these equations, then really what PP represents is the percent of organisms who are homozygous dominant in genotype. Um, they would have both dominant alleles if they are homozygous dominant. Um, 2PQ means that it would be organisms who have a P and a Q. So this really represents the percent of organisms who are heterozygous in genotype. So um, why is it 2PQ, you might ask? Because you can kind of think of it as there's two ways you can be heterozygous. You can either have the dominant allele first and the recessive allele, or you can kind of have the recessive allele first and the dominant allele. There are kind of two ways to be heterozygous, so that's why we um, ha have it be 2PQ. Um, and then finally, Q squared is the percent of organisms who are homozygous recessive because, again, that's simply like QQ, or um, having both alleles being recessive. And all we're saying is if we add up all these possibilities, um, those percentages should add up to 100% as well. So um, how could we apply this? Let me try and give you an example of a population again. Let's go back to one of our gene pools from earlier in the video. And if we could, once again, directly see the genotypes of organisms, then we could just simply count the number of dominant alleles. So let's say that we've got 7 um, of the 40 alleles here are dominant, so that's 17%. Um, and that means that P would, would be 0 0.175. Remember that we are going to write it in decimals, um, not as percentages. Um, that means that 33 of the other alleles are recessive, so that's 82.5%, um, and that would be represented as Q in our um, Hardy-Weinberg equation framework. So um, why is that kind of useful? Because if we assume this population is in equilibrium, then we could actually derive the genotypes um, by simply squaring P and squaring Q to get homozygous dominants and recessives. Uh, I know that I could actually count these guys as well. So if I counted how many of them were homozygous dominant, it'd be 1 out of the 20. Now, if you actually put 0.175 and you square that in your calculator, you should get about 0 0.03. So it predicts that it should have been like 3%, not 5%. Um, and you might ask, so what gives? Why isn't it exactly the same? Uh, because I have a pretty small population here. I've got 20 organisms, not an infinitely large population. So if I had made my sample size a little bigger, first of all, I would have broken PowerPoint. Um, but second of all, um, I would have gotten closer to that prediction. So um, I could also count how many are heterozygous, and it'd be 5 of the 20, or 25%. And if I were to um, run the equations and calculate 2 times 0.175 times 0.825, I actually get that that's about 29% pretty close. And for Q squared, if I count how many of them are homozygous recessive, then I get 14 of the 20, or 70%. And so I predict that um, Q squared to be about um, 0.68, actually, if I squared 0.825. So um, these equations kind of approximate what I uh, ought to see based on my um, calculations. And again, if you're wondering, well, when, would this when would this ever be useful? Well, in real life situations, remember, we can't see organisms' genotypes. What we can see, though, are their phenotypes. 
So let's say we know what's dominant and what's recessive by simply crossing organisms and seeing what dominates. So I already know that black is dominant over recessive, but I can just see that in this population of mice, most of them have uh, sandy color fur, which is actually what is homozygous recessive. What's really nice about Hardy-Weinberg calculations, if I can assume that this population is in equilibrium, is that I can directly observe how many organisms are homozygous recessive. I can count Q squared. And once I get Q squared, then I can do several interesting things. I can square root it and estimate Q. I can then, once I obtain Q, I can find P, because P and Q have to add up to be 1. And once I know P and Q, I can estimate how many of those black mice ought to be homozygous dominant, and how many of those black mice ought to be heterozygous. So I can kind of use phenotypes to get to genotypes, and then I can figure out my um, allele frequencies um, from there. So uh, it, it's, it's useful in um, um, doing estimates of population genetics without having to draw blood from every single mouse and genotype them. So um, I'm going to work more of the, the practice problems in um, a future video. So um, in this video, we simply just talked about what is the modern definition of evolution. I at least identified the five evolutionary forces, although you're going to have to define them um, in class or on your own a little bit more precisely. And we talked about a little bit about Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and how it's a useful ideal model for thinking about populations and their gene pools.